everybody here on their excellent decision to come here today <laughs> and discuss food security in Hawaii. And uh, uh, it wasn't always something that we had to worry about in Hawaii. And uh, studying history, there was 400,000 Hawaiians living on this island that had their own system of food security. Half a million. Half a, half a million? I say it's 400,000. <laughs> or 50. So, so the, thing, the, the thing I want to I want to talk about is, is, that, is that that system can be present today here in a different form called the modern Apua. And, and uh, I wanted to uh, talk about how this came about. We, we received a grant to do this uh, uh, educational series, which is a series of 12, with Kalani Honua. And uh, Kalani, Kalani Honua is an integral part of this operation. Last, the last one we had at, at Kalani's place at the Blue Moon Room, which is an educa a, a tremendous educational opportunity, I thought. And uh, I wanted to also uh, introduce our teacher here. I'm happy to welcome Wade Bauer of Ono Landscapes uh, to do this presentation. Oh, uh, Wade does uh, uh, some of the best landscapes that I've seen in Puna that are all edible. In fact, if anybody's been to the Natch and they've seen the landscape to the right of uh, the Natch building, that's Wade's also. And uh, Wade is going to help you get sustainable with your food supply. Not only uh, uh, is he a good educator, but he's going to teach you how to uh, bring all of this information home so that you have an idea of how to not only plant these foods, but also prepare them. So, so during the class you'll be learning about it, but afterwards you're going to be actually eating them and trying them. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Wade Bauer. Thank you very much for all coming today. Uh, first, I want to thank Hawaiian Sanctuary and Kalani. Um, they're putting this on through a grant. Um, that's how I'm able to be here today with you. Um, and thank you, thank you so, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really impressed with the turnout and the interest in this. Um, and I, I really don't consider myself an expert. I have some information. I want to share that with you. I've created this handout um, with a lot more information on it. A um, hundred plants is a lot to cover, um, so we're probably not going to go into very much depth on a lot of these. But what I want to focus on are the key crops um, for this area that are extremely easy to grow, um, and they've been used around the world um, as the base for food systems in the tropics. Um, See, so without any ado, let's um, let's move forward. Um, so I don't really want to talk much about the problem of, of what we're facing, but we kind of need to address that to um, to focus on the solution. So our food supply, 80% of it being shipped from the mainland. So how do we reclaim that, grow our food here, instead of having it shipped over. Um, and permaculture is a good answer to that. Um, it's about focusing on solution. Um, it's about um, incorporating indigenous practices with modern scientific knowledge and, and copying nature, working with nature instead of against it. Okay. Um, so I just want to go over some principles, some basic permaculture principles really quickly. Um, there's big textbooks written on this, which I recommend if you have the time to read. Um, but it's, it's really pretty simple and a lot of it's pretty common sense. But this, these are kind of the, uh, the tools in our toolbox. The permaculture principles are the tools that we're going to use to be able to create um, a sustainable um, food supply, and not just food, this pertains to many other areas, socially, economically as well. Um, so the first one is work where it counts. Um, so it's about efficiency. It's about leverage. If we can do something that has a huge effect, but it only takes a small amount of work, like planting a coconut tree. You know how you plant a coconut tree? There you go. That's it. 
You set it on the ground, it's going to sprout, it's going to grow into a tree. How much effort did that take? Runs, oh my gosh. So if we, so things like this, coconuts, bananas, ulu uh, trees, tree crops, things that are long lived, long lasting, it's going to make a huge return for a very small investment. That's not saying that we don't need to put some thought into where we're planting that tree or can cause more problems than it's worth. Um, so redundancy. So each important function has many supporting elements. So, so it's, let's say, um, let's talk about uh, carbohydrate crops, staple crops. Okay, this is what the majority of the world depends on for the majority of their calories. Okay, and, and for, for here, it's breadfruit, it's bananas, and not just, not just ripe bananas, cooked bananas. Bananas is the number five food crop worldwide after rice, corn, a couple others. And how many of us eat green bananas? Can I see a show of hands? How many of people? Nice. People in the front. You have. Cool. So, but, but you saw right there, real quick, like, you know, if it's the number five food crop in the world, and we had a show of hands, maybe like, you know, quarter, a fifth of this audience here is using that crop in that way, you know, that kind of, that's my point. That's, that gives us like, that's a starting point. Including these crops that worldwide have really, or they're really significant and bringing them in. So, so we've got ulu, we've got bananas, uh, but what happens if there's a drought? Okay, we might, the ulus can drop their fruit, they won't produce. Um, we can have the uh, same failure with taro as well, which is another good one. Um, so then we have cassava. So that's a, that's a backup, a redundancy for, so we have these different foods, family <coughs> foods as well, where if our main crop fails, then something else is going to take its place. So we're building redundancy in our systems. So there's not, we're not just depending on one thing, we're depending, we have, we have main things we're depending on, and then we have backups if those fail. So the same thing can be used in a water system. You have a main water catchment, you have a backup system, and you have a pond. Okay, so if one of those fails, you're not completely without water. Uh, multifunctional elements. So as many functions as we can get out of each piece. Um, one of my favorite examples for this is, a, is living fence posts. You can, uh, with the glaricidia here, it gets much bigger. You can cut stakes of it, plant them in the ground, and they will grow, and then you can put a fence right onto those stakes. Can you hold a piece of that up for me? And, and what was it called? What's it called? Glaricidia. Yeah, glaricidia. What's the common name? Uh, it just goes, um, he goes by Glaricidia. Madre de Cacao is uh, the Spanish name. <coughs> no, this is not Kachuk. It, huh? it just roots if you stick it in the soil? Yeah, but we for, for fence posts, you want to use something that's you know large, big enough to support a fence. Okay, so that can be put in the ground instead of your fence stakes. So you save money, you don't have to buy fence stakes, so you can use this. Then you can plant a living, yeah. Um, you can grow partial shade. Um, so then you can plant a lid, so you can plant a vine on your fence. So now your fence is a trellis, it's producing food. This can be cut back. Glare City can be cut back for mulch. So you, then your fence is also producing mulch. So now we have food and mulch out of your fence. So you could just have a fence, by metal post, or you could have a living fence post and have production out of that fence at the same time. Um, and that's just one of many does, examples. Does it need a lot of soil? What's that? Does it need a lot of soil? Um, it does need some soil, yep. Like. Uh, so you can't plant it straight into rock, no. It's no, I, I understand, but. Yeah. This much? Um, well, 
<laughs> it doesn't need that much necessarily. I mean, if you're planting, if you want to plant a fence, well, you know, we, we have some problem with soil here. I mean, uh, at least I. <laughs> sure. Maybe. A lot of us do. <laughs> right. I have a question. Where would you source something like that? Um, uh, talk to me afterwards. Okay. And is this going to be strong enough to hold up the pigs and the dogs and everything? Once it gets rooted in. If you're if you're working with shallow soil, you know if you can um, if you've got just even a little bit of soil, and you can prop up rocks around the base of that cutting, yeah, it's going to take it a while to root in, but eventually it will root in. And this isn't a technique to use. This isn't a technique to use everywhere, but you know it's just one example of multiple functions for things. Okay. Um, Let's see. Um, so, um, using energies and objects for their highest purpose. Um, so, uh, kitchen waste going to chickens instead of straight to the compost. You're getting another output out of that energy of the eggs. Um, also, using cardboard for a weed barrier for sheet mulching, which we'll get into more what that is later. Um, the problem is the solution. So, weed trees as mulch. You see all this cane grass and albizia? It's building soil. It can be used to our advantage. Okay, so we look at a we look at something identified as a problem, and then we use it to our advantage. We're working with nature instead of because you can take a field of cane grass and you can just keep cutting it down a million times. It's just building you soil. So there's ways we can we can use that and then choke that out with like a weed barrier, and then come in and we have really fertile soil to work with. So it's ways of working with nature instead of against it. <coughs> um, the key to managing biological resources is timing. All that means is, is that say we plant a, say we plant a banana and it fruits, and then we're not around when it, we're not paying attention to it, goes to fruit, rats eat it. Okay, we didn't, we, our timing was off. Or we plant mulch trees, okay, we plant a tree that we're gonna cut down to feed to our other trees, but then we leave it and we don't cut it down when we're supposed to to feed it to those other trees, and it grows over our fruit trees and shades them out. Okay, so timing is crucial with what we're doing to manage these biological resources. Um, zones. Basically zones are the most frequently used items you want in close. So your annual garden needs a lot of attention. If it's on the other side of your property, it's not going to get that attention. If it's right outside your kitchen door, it's much more likely to get the attention that it needs. Same goes for nurseries. <clears throat> and then on the reverse of that, large trees that don't take much care can go farther away, the edges of your property, where they, you know, you're not, you don't go there that, much, that often. You know, you know when that tree's fruity and you can go to that area to harvest the fruit then. Um, starting small and intensive. Rome was not built in a day. We've got a Pick one little area, start with a set of plants, get growing, have a small success, and then slowly expand from there. That's not to say that we can't make a design on a large scale to begin with. In fact, that's very recommended, but it all happens in steps, right? One step after the other. Uh, mimicking nature, this is about creating a food forest, which we'll get into more later. Um, modeling how nature works, right? There's a ground cover, there's plants coming out of that, then there's big trees. So we can make our gardens in that same way. And what that does is it fills <coughs> these different niches, these different places for things to grow. So there's basically no room for weeds to come in if we, if we can plant our systems correctly. Using indigenous practices and plants, the canoe plants here are made for the Pacific Islands. You know, a lot of people come here and they want to grow 
nice big tomato, or nice big cucumber, you know, things you're used to on the mainland. Well, guess what? That's not the stuff that necessarily wants to grow here. Well, one of my favorite quotes is, learn to love to eat what loves to grow where you live. Okay, so that is our biggest challenge, which is learning to use these new food crops and incorporating them into our diets. In my opinion, that is our biggest challenge. Because mm. growing most of these food crops is not that hard. But changing our diets, mm. another good quote, kind of goes along with this, is people will change their religion before they will change their diet. <laughs> okay? So this, this is a very serious thing we're talking about. If that quote is true, which I feel it is, you know, this is a very important and meaningful task we're setting out to do here. And it's not easy, but it's worthwhile. And, you know, all you guys showing up here today, you know, proves that to me, that, you know, you're all here for this same reason. Yeah. I just want to point out the Japanese cucumbers grow very well here, and I'm growing them like this big. Nice. So in Sea View. In Sea View, down by in, the coast. In Sea View, down by the coast. <laughs> and microclimates, too. You know, we're all in this room, and we live in within, like, you know, probably at most 15 miles of each other. But there is a massive difference between coast and here and... Laakea, the top of the hill. So, microclimate. Yeah. Very different microclimates in just a small area. Which means that's great. If you live there, you can do that. You can try it somewhere else. It may not work. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to farmers in your areas with experience. Somebody in your neighborhood has lots more experience than than I do. I know lots of farmers who have way more experience than I do with using these local plants. So find out what works for your specific area. Talk to your neighbors. You know, prepare food with your neighbors. Find out recipes that, that people make. I'm still finding out stuff all the time from people. New ways to use these same group of plants. Let's see. Um, so let's go into right into siting gardens. Is, is there any other questions about the permaculture principles and? I just have a, I have a question about yeah. your example of cane grass. Yeah. So, um, so if you have cane grass growing, uh, what you're saying is just cut it down and just leave it there for mulch. I'm talking I'm talking more about with cane grass. I'm talking about if you have like a field of cane grass. If yeah. you have a big area yeah. dominated by cane grass. Um, that until you want to put that area into production, that cane grass is building your soil. Okay, but if you just have a little bit of if cane grass... If you just have cane grass coming up where you don't want it, you need to dig it out. Dig it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can, or you can use a piece of weed barrier yeah. and chop it up and put that piece of weed barrier over it to smother it out. So even just cardboard will work? Um, it can work if you keep on it. Yeah, okay. you may have to do it a couple times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I want to go right into siting gardens. So how do we get there? How do we create these gardens? Okay. Um, so picking the right spot, right? Everything has its place. Okay. So where is the best place for your garden? And I just recently talked with. Um, this man who has a tropical permaculture site in Costa Rica, one of the biggest collections of plants um, in South America. Um, and I brought him to my place and said, you need to maximize the east and the south sun. Now, I know that maybe seemed kind of, kind of simple, right? That the sun comes up, but he told me that most plants, their main growth period is in the morning and the peak of harvest is like kind of you know before noon so so when plants are getting that sun early it's really beneficial for them 
So if we can place our gardens where they're getting the maximum amount of east and south sun, it's going to be beneficial for us. And this also goes for orchards. Okay? Um, and then maximizing the proximity to the kitchen, as I said before. Giving this garden the best, uh, what is it? The best uh, fertilizer is a gardener's shadow. <laughs> Another of my favorite quotes. All right, you get it? And it's very true. It's very true. Because sometimes a plant just needs a tiny bit of love and it'll thrive. Right. Uh, maximizing soil fertility in flat areas. Um, mm -hmm. If you've got, so if you have a, a spot with those first two, and then you've got, you know, a flat area, um, weeds are a good indicator of fertility, plant growth. If you see an area where your grass is growing like this tall instead of this tall, well, it's growing that tall for a reason. So pay attention to these things and try to figure out where you can find soil. You can also dig holes, but the plants really do a lot of that indication for us. Um, so uh, nearby mulch plants. So does everybody understand what I'm saying when I say mulch? Do I need a definition of mulch? So mulch is anything. It can be this banana leaf. It can be, or it can be something that's woody, right? Okay. So nature mulches itself. You go, in, you see a tree in the forest. There's leaf litter on the forest. There's dead branches. It's a natural process. So we can accelerate that, move things around to feed our plants. This is just food. This is fertilizer. So we can, we can use plants that are existing already um, and cut them back. All these gingers, this big heliconia, uh, these ferns here, all of that great mulch. Anything that won't grow back when you cut it and put it on the ground, great mulch. Um, and we can plant those things, if they're not already there, if there's not stuff there already that we can use, we can plant that specifically for that purpose. And having it near enough so we don't have to drag it all the way across our property to get it to its destination. Um, there are some plants that are uh, allelopathic, so they will inhibit the growth of other things, like ironwood is a good example of that. Um, but even those, if, if that material is broken down long enough, um, it doesn't become a problem anymore. Um, she's asking about ironwood, if there's anything she can grow underneath it. What's your coconuts and ferns? Mushrooms. Mushrooms? Somebody says. Anybody else know the answer to that? saw papaya growing at the bottom You saw papaya growing at the bottom one? Lily Coy. Oh, there you go. Um, so siting orchards. So we talk about siting our gardens, siting our orchards, and pop proper tree spacing. Tree spacing is the number one, putting your trees too close together, is the number one mistake that people make. And it's really pretty easy to avoid, but you have to know how big that tree is going to get. You've got to design from the end. So what is that tree going to look like when it's full grown? Okay, and that's, I put all this stuff in this handout, the different sizes that these plants get so that you can space them properly. For example, a ulu tree, it's going to get at least 30 feet wide, possibly more, probably up to even up to 40 feet wide. Okay, if you plant another tree 10 feet from that, what's going to happen? It's going to get swallowed up. Okay, it's pretty little. So, our tallest trees, the opposite of the garden, we want to put them to the north and the west side so that we're maximizing our morning sun and then that shade is going off our property. Because sun is like, I recently uh, did some bulldozing you know, and opened up my land and sometimes I call it vitamin S because it just 
it just changes everything. When you get plant sun, you know, that's lots of times here, that's a limiting factor. Unless you're on lava, and then it could be soil. Um, airflow. airflow as well. Airflow as well, yep. And that's another thing with spacing, is getting these trees properly spaced so they have airflow. Because you can plant all your trees so they're all right next to each other. You know, it's like our comfort zones. It's like, would you be comfortable if your neighbor was like sitting on your lap right now? Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe not. Okay. Everything needs a room. They need to. They need to be allowed to to reach their full potential. And if you're putting them too close together, they can't. Okay. A shorter trees closer into structures. It's kind of common sense. Um, another thing is strategic placement of trees to block early morning sun or late evening sun. So see we have this, this sun coming in here. Say this is your patio. Maybe you want a tree here you know, to block that sun to create some shade in your structure to keep your structures cooler. You also want to think about airflow. Where is your air coming from? You, know, you don't want to plant a, a wall of trees. It's a windbreak so it's just stagnant there. Notice where that wind is coming and allow that through your structure. Try to maximize that through your structures. Even. Okay, so I go into specific spacing of trees here. You're all going to get handouts, so I don't really feel it's necessary to go into all those spacings. Uh, measure before you plant. Before you plant. After, it doesn't do much good, <laughs> except teach you a lesson. Um, let's see here. Okay, so, um, so getting to, yeah. What is, what is coppice? Coppice. Coppice is simply uh, cutting back a tree repeatedly. That's what coppicing is. And with permaculture, we generally, we're coppicing back that tree, we're cutting back that tree, and then we're feeding it to the tree we want to grow. Okay, so let's say like our, we've got our coconut tree here. And when we plant this coconut tree, we want to plant, uh, let's see, well this isn't the exact, this is a, I wouldn't plant Glaricidia this close to a coconut tree. I would plant um, a pigeon pea this close to this coconut tree. Okay, this, this pigeon pea, we're calling this a pigeon pea, it's not really. It's going to grow about this wide, okay? It's going to grow about this big. And then we're going to cut it back about knee high, and then we're going to feed it around this coconut tree. And there can be a whole ring of them around the coconut tree. And so as this coconut tree is starting to grow, we're repeatedly cutting back this, this stuff. So it's got its food right here. So we're just cutting it and dropping it. It's also known as chop and drop. <laughs> Could you um, explain more about space and time, as you mentioned in there, like with the time and like your... Yes, exactly. So space and time. So, so this coconut tree is eventually going to be 30 feet wide and can get up to 100 feet tall, eventually. But right now, it's less than one foot tall. <laughs> So we've got some time until this tree reaches that size. So during that time, we could plant some other things around this coconut to fill that space, get a yield out of this space while that coconut is growing. Um, so things like pumpkin is a great ground cover, helps shade out other weeds. We could even do some sweet potato around it. We could do pineapple <laughs> around it. We could do some uh, papayas, as long as they're spaced out far enough. Maybe like 10, 15 feet from it. How long do papayas live? I mean, what's their life cycle? Uh, their productive life cycle is kind of like three to five years. So you would put that, you would consider that in your... In your so that's a short term, yeah. So this, this coconut, you know, it's going to produ start producing like, depending on the variety, maybe like seven <coughs> to 14 years. And so we can use that same idea in our gardens as well. Say we have an eggplant or something that's going to take maybe 120 days, 
and then we have some daikon radish. They're going to take 30 days. Well, we can plant that one, the bigger plant in the center, do a ring of smaller things around it that are going to be harvested before they're impacting the space of that other plant. So again, with knowing how long, roughly how long things take, their sizes, we can start to put things together in a way where we're filling these gaps in, in space as well as time. Yeah. I have a question when we're talking about the distance between when we're doing our planting, how deep should we plant the trees? Is there an advantage in making the whole deeper and bigger or is uh, there's good happening? information. There's so she's asking about uh, planting the fruit trees. Um, there's really great information <coughs> online about that. Uh, you can look that up. Planet Hawaii is one of the biggest nurseries here. I believe they have that information on their <coughs> website. They recommend, two feet. Huh? They, recommend two they recommend two feet. There you go. I, I would follow what they recommend. I mean, yes, to some extent, it may help to dig a bigger hole to give it more food. Sure, but is it totally necessary? You know, is it working where it counts? Do you hold that the most important is like the top six inches? That's yes. Absolutely. And if you dig a hole and see where roots are, then, you know, that shows you. That's where the, the most of the roots are in that top layer of soil. Okay. Um, now, if you are on lava and you can get a hole dug, it's going to be beneficial because then they can put some tap roots down, they have a reserve. Or the other technique you can use is just to, to build up on top of the lava and then, and then expand that, that soil layer as your tree mm. gets bigger. Mm. So you don't have to have this much soil over your whole property to start with. You just need this much soil in an area this big to plant a tree. <coughs> And then as that tree grows, you just keep adding more soil around it. Okay. Okay, so, yes? Could you repeat the questions? Because we can't hear them back here. Okay, yeah, sorry. Questions. That doesn't make sense. That, she was asking about um, uh, planting holes okay, thank for you. trees. Yeah. So what about uh, planting perennials around the base of your tree? Absolutely. That's okay? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, ground covers instead of grass ground covers instead what, of grass what do you recommend um you know there's perennial peanut ground cover which is a no mow um but it takes a lot of effort to get it to the point it's no mow and then it's still it's not no weeds it's just no <laughs> mow <laughs> right so you know, it's it's kind of a tra it's kind of a trade off. It's like how much energy do you want to spend in a, in a doing that? Uh, for me, I mean, ground covers are great though, especially around the bases of trees, like long term perennial ground covers, so you don't have to mow right up to the base of your tree. Did I answer your question? So you mow. I mow. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do. And if you want to be a purist, get one of those real push mowers that doesn't take any, that doesn't do gas. It works. <laughs> yes. I guess putting on my lava stone and see if it'll create dirt now. So yes. It's useful. Yes. It breaks down instantly. On Absolutely. I like to think about when I'm mowing that I'm harvesting mulch. <laughs> Makes me feel a little better. Yeah. <laughs> it's true.